Hey everybody, it's Chainsaw Reacts back once again with another video for you guys. Today I have the opportunity to speak with Joshua Fine, the supervising producer of Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes. I'm so excited to talk to him. I can't wait to speak to him about all the different things about the show, the characters, the stories, the stories they've told, maybe even a little bit about season three. I'll definitely ask about season three stuff. We'll see where that goes. Um, but I'm really excited to talk to him because he reached out to me on an uh, email last year while I was watching the show. It was during the 10-year anniversary of Avengers Earth Mightiest Heroes. He discovered my reactions and everything, and he reached out to me on email. And I responded to him freaking out like, holy crap, a guy who actually worked on the show and had a major role in the show reached out and actually even watched my reactions. That's awesome. So I'm really excited to talk to him, and thankfully he responded back pretty quickly when I asked for an interview, and he said yes. So I'm definitely excited to talk to him. So here it is, my interview with Joshua Fine. Hope you guys enjoy. Thank you, Joshua, for being here. Um, I'm so excited to talk to you. When you reached out to me through email last year, I freaked out. I'm like, you worked on the show. This is so <laughs> cool. Um, I want to start off by asking, what video did you find of mine that made you go like, oh, this guy's watching the show that I worked on? <laughs> what, 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 do you remember which one it was? I don't remember specifically which episode it was. Uh, we hit the 10-year anniversary of the show earlier this yeah. fall. Yeah. And so I was kind of perusing the internet, looking for people that were talking about the anniversary or whatnot. And YouTube fed me one of your reaction videos for the show. And then I started watching all of your reactions because it was oh. fun not only to experience uh, the show again from the point of view of somebody that hadn't seen it before, but also reading the comments of other people that were enjoying uh, that same experience. was It's cool. Yeah, it was, it was crazy because people were recommending it for quite some time and I've heard of, I heard about the show back when it was airing and then people kept talking about it. I'm like, you know what? I'll give it a, sh I'll give it a shot. And um, it was, I was trying to figure out, okay, how to watch it. Cause there was like, I think it was like on the web or something like you had split up certain like segments and then they formatted them into episodes later for airing. Yeah. Uh, what was the, what was the decision on that? Was that like a decision for the network or was that a decision for you guys to kind of introduce the show in a different way for online and then to television? So the micro series, depending on who you ask, was either my single best idea of all time or my single worst idea of all time. Um, I'm still partial to it, uh, but uh, the origin of it is kind of interesting because I had been working on a different series before Avengers. Um, we were developing a Hulk animated series that never ended up uh, making it past the first episode of scripting. Um, and as we were working on that, one of our network partners, uh, we were working with Nicktoons on a couple of shows, Wolverine and the X-Men and Iron Man Armored Adventures at the time. Uh, somebody from the network reached out and they were interested in the Hulk series that we were working on. And they asked if there were any plans to create, uh, micro content, like mm. two to five minute snippets. Um, one of the reasons was that Cartoon Network had had a ton of success with Gendy Tartakovsky's Clone Wars series, which was done in that kind of um, format. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and working on the Hulk, I had no plans to do anything like that. And I kind of responded, no, these are going to be full 22-minute episodes. Um, and then completely unrelated, a few weeks later, I got an email from our toy partner, Hasbro, asking if we had any micro content because they were interested in putting small clips of animation and stuff potentially in with toys to help kind of give a bigger experience to, to buying action figures and stuff. Yeah. And I again responded, no, we don't really have anything like that. <laughs> uh, so the Hulk series got canceled and we moved on and we decided that we were going to do an Avengers series. Mm. And my boss at the time tasked me with coming up with kind of a, a business model for the show, an outline of what the, the show's goals were going to be mm -hmm. and what we were hoping to accomplish by making it, um, which I had never done before. And as I was thinking about the property, I had this other outstanding issue with the Avengers that I was trying to solve. Uh, mm -hmm. Did my video just cut out? No, you're good. Okay. Um, which is that one of the coolest things to me about the Avengers is that they are individual heroes that each exist in the universe mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and were doing their own things before becoming a team. And, and the cool thing about the team is that there is this history for each character individually so that when they finally team up it's like a huge crossover that doesn't stop happening yeah um and i was trying to figure out some way because like the closest comparison at the time to this kind of a show was um dc's justice league right but G yeah. dc's justice league had been uh preceded by Batman the Animated Series and Superman. And there was history for at least some of those characters before they formed their team. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I was looking for, like, we didn't obviously have time to make a full series for each one of the characters that were going to become part of the Avengers. So the moral of the story is I had three different problems that all solved each other. Mm -hmm. which is that if I could take the first five episodes of our show and break them up into micro content, then I could potentially do backstory for each one of the characters. Um, and then we could, we could have sort of the best of both worlds, which is, you know, something that feels like a team of guys with a history coming together, uh, guys and girls coming together and, uh, and forming the Avengers for the first time. So I pitched that idea and everybody loved it. And um, we were off to the races and and Chris Yost, our head writer, I think did a phenomenal job executing uh, the idea. And then and then the worst, the worst part of this idea comes into play, which is that we get to production. And normally when you're producing an animated series, um, there's a design process where you design the core characters and the core backgrounds that you're going to use. And all of these assets have to be created. The issue with the micro series is that we were basically designing for six different animated series, all within the first five episodes of the show, because we have to create Iron Man's whole world and his whole cast of supporting characters and uh, his environments. And then we have to do the same thing for Hulk. And then we have to do the same thing for Captain America. And you get to episode six where we're finally introducing like the mansion and the Quinjet and stuff, which is what you would normally be designing for an animated series. And uh, yeah, so the amount, just the sheer volume of design work that had to be done at the beginning of the series almost sank us early on. Like there was a lot of sleepless nights and a lot of hard work put in by the design team to get us through that section. But um, I think it, I, I still think it was worth it. I think it paid off. Um, I think, yeah, it paid off. It, I didn't think about was a that. huge hit when we launched it on YouTube. It built up a lot of excitement for the show before it mm -hmm. debuted. Um, and now there's more confusion, right? Because the micros get repackaged into full length episodes and they're kind of out of order, I think, on Disney Plus. And yeah, because yeah. Breakout part one and part two are first, and then you have this. And I'm like, yeah. and people thankfully told me, don't watch them in the order of Disney Plus, watch it like this. So I follow that formula. Um, but I even think about all all the d designs of everybody's like separate worlds, and then finally combine like, that. Yeah, that's a lot of work because you could have easily just started off just as they're a team. But I love that you spent that time to set each of them up in their own it, it, the world, but not really because they're all within the same world. I, I think that was really smart because it adds more depth to the characters and you're still yeah. learning about them past the point of working together. Cause it, it's not like they all came together. Like, yay, we're a happy family. Cause that's a typical way to go for a show. It's like, Oh, they're all working together and it's fine. Like, no, there was a lot of tension and people are not sure of each other. And they're all like, I think that was really smart. Um, in, in talking about the designing. So what made you guys go, let's go for traditional comics in terms of these characters. Cause you could have easily, adapted them a certain different way or maybe change some of the looks what made you guys decide let's go with traditional comics from like back in the day because like you just basically pulled from the comics and just brought it over in a animation yeah it was really the design style of uh Ciro Nelly, our, our supervising director mm -hmm. um he had a vision i mean he was a huge comic book fan uh coming into it and he had a vision for just a very classic approach to the character is colorful and graphic and yeah. um just capturing kind of the best elements of um 
uh, especially like the Stanley Jack Kirby era of, mm-hmm. of Avengers um, to give it a very classic feel. And uh, we were just drawn to it and we loved it. And that's what we ran with. I mean, it's, it's so different and it stands out in a big way. I think really, people really appreciate it. I, I appreciate it. I'm like, this is so cool. Like I would have been fine if you guys went a different direction, but I think it was so cool. You stuck with, let's go with this look. And some people might think it's Hawkeye's look. It's a little odd, but when you look at the comics and where he came from, it just kind of fits. It works with his character. He's, he's a standout character. Of course. Um, I want to talk about story for a little bit because yeah. you guys pulled a lot of traditional comic storylines and brought them in. And of course, with telling your own stuff and kind of what was like, what was the thinking of like, trying to figure out how to work that throughout a season where you had some overarching storylines that carried throughout and others that were singleized pretty much per episode. Was that like a conscious decision to do that and not have single episodes where a storyline just starts and stops in one episode or was it always the plan to kind of tell those kind of stories where it can go on for multiple episodes? So one of the, the goals for the series early on um, was to include some amount of serialization into it because for me at least you can't get uh, avengers level stakes into stories unless the audience believes that some stuff could actually change permanently um (laughs) some characters could die like we're not beyond doing that characters could leave the team they could join the team um so serialization was important but we also didn't want to over serialize it. We didn't want everything to be cliffhangers. We mostly wanted to ha- have every episode have a beginning, middle and end um, to them. Even in the multi-part episodes, we tried to contain uh, like the Kang trilogy of episodes. Each one of those three episodes has its own distinct beginning, middle and end to them. So that if that's the only episode you see, it still would feel like a complete experience. Um, so that, that, that was definitely something that we were aiming for from the very beginning. And um, our very first meeting, Chris and I sat down to figure out what the overarching plot of the season would be. So that was something that we were thinking about right away and figuring out who our big bad was going to be and how that plot was going to interconnect with everything else going on. Um, we didn't solve it right away, but pretty early on we knew we got to a point where we felt like this series was trying to represent the most classic version of the Avengers. We whittled the team down to actually the original Avengers team from the comics. And at that point, it felt like, well, if we're going to use the original Avengers team, it feels like Loki should be the one who's responsible for the formation of the team. Yes. And another thing that a lot of people forget watching this series now is that we were doing this way before the Avengers happened in the cinematic universe. Yeah. At the time that we started working on it in 2008, uh, Iron Man one was out. Incredible Hulk was out. And that was it. (laughs) I mean, yeah. I mean, think about now. I mean, that makes sense. The MCU did it, but you guys were like working on it to happen way before. And people are like, Oh, that's where, that's where they got the inspiration. The MCU, no, this was way before. This was, you know, before any of that. I mean, of course, they developed movies for years, but um, yeah, like that was what I asked about that. So character-wise, so with you guys choosing on characters, of course, within season one, we have a certain amount of characters, and of course, you had certain things happening where you're introducing new faces, and they'll be gone for a while and come back. Was that always like a thing to where let's just go into the pantheon of characters and let's see who can work? And was there some characters you wanted to have within the seasons that you know were actually made of course because season three should have happened um was there certain characters you wanted to use that maybe was tossed around and ended up not happening for different reasons yeah uh definitely Uh, when chris and i first sat down we had lists of different roster combinations that we could do all of our favorite characters from throughout avengers lore um there were some obvious ones that we knew for sure weren't probably going to be on the original team like vision because we knew we wanted to tell his story within the series Mm -hmm. um but eventually like the perfectly balanced team that we arrived at was the original team and that started to inform a lot of our other decisions so once we knew we were going to use the original team it started to make sense to have hulk leave the team in the second 
assembled episode of of the series and to start to reflect kind of the the pattern that the original comics took in some way um but there were definitely other characters that um could have been included and that we were planning to include eventually if we ever got to them i, I know the, the top two requests always are scarlet witch and quicksilver everybody wanted to see them yeah. join the team and we were perennially looking for the right time for that to happen mm -hmm. and it started to identify itself as season three just based on the themes that we were probably going to get to in season three mm -hmm. um but obviously the show never made it that far so everybody blames us for never getting them on the show which is fair well i mean with the stories you guys were telling i mean they could have fit but i mean it wasn't like you guys introduced mutants like right away. Like you brought in Wolverine and New Avengers, um, which was like really close to the end of the show in terms of, you know, you guys obviously you were, you know, there was discussions. Of course, I, I, I wonder how far you got into season three, but I'll ask about that later. But uh, you didn't like jump in and look good like episode eight or nine of season one. Here's Wolverine. Here's mutants. Like you guys were taking your time with stuff. Um but that would have been really cool to see Scarlet Witch. Because, I mean, now with WandaVision, how popular that character is now even more so. That would yeah. be awesome to see that in Quicksilver, of course. Um, I want to talk about Ultron for a second. Because yeah. yeah, perfectly built up. You so many times, you guys are like, Ultron bots. Okay, cool. They're, well, it's not Ultron yet. Wait for it. And then you see the one close up of the, And you had like a, a little cameo of Mr. Fantastic. Like, oh, wait a Fantastic Four. Wait a minute. And then there's the bot slowly focusing on like okay well, what's happening here and then you get to ultron um was that always like off the bat like hey that's one of the storylines we want to get to within season one or was that something to where it just kind of happened where the story just kind of progressed there <laughs> no there were a few storylines that we definitely wanted to have on a slow burn building up over the course of the series uh, in general we tried not to rush anything we wanted to get as much mileage out of every element that we had at our disposal as possible Makes sense. Um, but Ultron was definitely one where like we started out teasing him in one of the micro episodes that Hank Pym won. And um, we, yeah, we just knew that it was going to be a slow, gradual turn that hopefully would keep audiences hooked on that story thread for a long time. It was so good. And the voice of Ultron it was fantastic. And then you, you, you were talking earlier about how the stakes and anything can happen. When Thor was basically obliterated, and I'm like, did they just kill Thor? Did they really just do that? And then you did it again with Black Panther in season two. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> what are you guys doing? But it was so well done because I honestly thought Thor was dead. I thought, like, like to Ultra, because if Ultron would have done that, that would have been the biggest move the show has done so far when I was watching it. Um, man. So, Black Panther that character of course very iconic character what was the thinking about bringing black panther into the mix was that like a decision to where it's like you know this is a very this is a character that would bring a very different representation to the show and basically bring a very different world to the show with wakanda and everything was that something you guys early on were talking about black panther yeah i mean uh one of our favorite avengers so it seemed and one of the coolest avengers i might add too it just seemed obvious that he should find a spot on the show at some point mm -hmm. um and he's got such such a rich world to draw from um that it it made sense also to put us in a difficult position of needing to design all of that for the micro episodes mm -hmm. um but it made sense to get to it early on um and to introduce him as one of the he and hawkeye kind of had that that back and forth <laughs> that back and forth and that joint role of being the guys that we were setting up to join the team eventually in season one that you knew eventually were probably going to join um but we didn't want uh to do it immediately gotcha that makes sense uh i just keep thinking there's so many things we could just bring up because like there's so many things <laughs> in my head like oh my gosh um because I, I used to jump to all the crazy stuff in season two but okay scrolls the yeah invasion, secret that blew me away. The last thing you see in season one, like I was like, Oh, you're doing secret invasion. You're doing scrolls. 
was that something you guys were discussing early on or was that something where as you're getting closer, like we should have a cliffhanger or some sort of big moment to lead over into season two? Because when that happened, that changes everything. Because you're thinking, why is there another cap in the room? And maybe people that didn't, didn't recognize scrolls. Like, was that in the early cards of like writing out ideas of things you want to do? Is like we gotta do secret invasion. So as we were working on the the show Bible to kind of lay out what our goals were for the series, um, Marvel Chief Creative Officer Joe Casada had mentioned that he really wanted us to do some. Uh, adaptations of current or or recent comic series in addition to adapting all of the older stuff, which makes total sense. Like we wanted to be drawing from the best of every era. And as we were looking at some of the recent stories that had come out in the comics at the time, Secret Invasion was definitely one that jumped out at us. Um, and then as we were, Chris and I were planning, trying to figure out what our plan for season two would be. I, I was looking for some kind of a theme to wrap everything around and came up with the idea if, as we were looking at kind of like all of the stories that we eventually wanted to get to in the show, mm -hmm. there was a subset of them that all fit into like this cosmic uh, Marvel theme. So we decided to focus season two around the cosmic side of the the Marvel universe and do a lot of, our space stories and stuff. And so adapting yeah, secret invasion at that point became pretty obvious. And uh, it's a good one to stretch out over a long period of time because it, again, it's one of those slow burn stories that works best when it's kind of happening little by little in the background. Just the, the fake cap. I called him fake cap the whole time. Like there's fake cap and I'm sitting there watching. And I love how within, within the episodes leading up to, of course, secret invasion, no one knows that Cap is a scroll, and you just find little ways to kind of highlight. You know, see, that's not Cap. Just a reminder in case you forget, that's not Cap. Um, I remember. So I think it was what? starting with season two was interesting, but we wanted to get some new costumes for the characters into the season. So yeah. Iron Man gets a new armor in season two, and Thor gets a new look in season two, and Cap gets his ultimate costume look in season two. And that was the plan before we were knewing, knew that we were doing Secret Invasion. But the offshoot of that is that it was always the scroll in the ultimate Captain America costume. And I think at some point, somebody on our design team, I think it was our production manager, Adam Middleton, dubbed that character Scrolltimate Cap. And that name caught on. So we referred to him as Scrolltimate Cap from that point on throughout the show. It was a really smart move to have him be fake cap or skeleton cap for a, a number of episodes not like because you could have easily had episode one as as not cap and then the second episode okay now let's reveal i was waiting i was like kept waiting like come on come on come on and like nope not happening like uh because it kept like i'm like when are they gonna find out because i kept thinking they keep they're trusting him and they don't know and then you find little ways to kind of add more depth to it like slowly building up that was really really good um now, for the Secret Invasion's actual arc, when they actually start invading, the bulletin board of pictures that Nick Fury is looking at, that to me was the best thing I have seen in quite some time in terms of cameos. Like, oh, okay, so you guys are Spider-Man, Wolverine, Professor X, Magneto, and the Cyclops and Beast. Like, oh my gosh, there's so many faces. So when you were creating that image of all those pictures, what was the thinking of like, okay, let's just throw in a bunch of faces and see what happens. It's one of those moments that you know people are going to freak out about and pause and scrutinize endlessly. So you just want to have as much fun with it as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so there, there were some big characters that I knew that we wanted to have on there as teases like Magneto and uh, a few of the X-Men and Spider-Man. And, um, but uh, our character, our character designer at the time, Tom Perkins was uh you know, he's a huge Marvel nut, and there are all these obscure characters, uh, very much lesser known characters that he's a huge fan of that he wanted to have on that board. So, so he was designing endlessly, like, can we put this guy on there? Can we put this person on there? And uh, we let we let a few of them go through because they were they were cool. Like, I think 3D Man made it on there. That was one of his favorites, and um, I don't remember who else. I mean it was just such a cool moment because as I'm like watching the show, I'm like, okay, 
you guys tease Fantastic Four in season one, and we see these little cameos. We had it's clobber time in the uh, the casket of ancient winters, which is such an epic moment. I'm like, okay, first of all, there's Human Torch, and then he just jumps like all of a sudden. Here's the thing, he just shows up. I'm like, this is so amazing that the show can just throw in. Here's the thing. Here we go. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was the thinking behind Fantastic Four? Because I mean, you already have this iconic team of the Avengers. Was that was that just way of just kind of starting to slowly expand the world past the traditional Avengers roster and just kind of show that the world is infinite amount of heroes and it's not just the Avengers? Because you could have easily just kind of ignored everybody else and just kind of kept it as a core. So was it just a thing to where let's expand and show there's other teams and other heroes outside of the Avengers roster we know? Yeah, right from the beginning, we, we wanted it to feel like a very densely populated Marvel world. Um, I mean, we we're already using every supervillain like ever created for the, the breakout episodes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, every opportunity that we could find, we were throwing in little Easter eggs and, and nuggets. And we do like the gag with the cabbie reading the newspaper in a couple of the episodes early on. We yeah, tease like Punisher like and Man Thing and Xavier School and yes. Um, it, it, we always wanted it to feel big and not small. We always wanted it to feel like, given the opportunity, we have hundreds of more episodes that we could do and and you know thousands of more characters that we could explore and they're out there. We want we want we always wanted to feel like none of these things were coming out of left field. Like they've been teased, they exist in the universe. So. That was it was so well done because I'm like just sitting there watching an episode of Avengers. All of a sudden, here's the thing: here's Human Torch, and then we get to Fantastic Four within the season two premiere, and it's like, oh, here's the Fantastic Four. They're just showing up for cards. They're just hanging out, and then Doctor Doom. That was oh such a good opening of that episode. I'm like, okay, so I, I, it's already obvious by the title, Doctor Doom, but like we're getting Doom, and yeah, then yeah. of course the reveal of Sue Storm being a scroll. Like that was like they never, like, of course they didn't find out why Doom took her. Now we know she's, she's a scroll. She's not even really Sue. Um, uh, okay. So the final episode of the show, we have Galactus. Now, yes. before I get to other questions, I want to know, cause I, I had a, I had a, a mention this Galactus didn't speak. Was that a decision on your guys part to like, let like what, what lines could he say? Or was it to like, let's just not have him talk. Let's have this other guy who comes in at the beginning to speak for Galactus and then have this being that they've never seen before that we saw a little bit earlier teased in the show to kind of just be so otherworldly that he doesn't speak at all. Yeah, that was the goal really was to make him feel so alien and otherworldly that it was just terrifying. This isn't somebody that could be reasoned with. Oh, It's almost a force of nature. You know, and it also gives the heralds a, a bit more purpose in that they are his mouthpiece. They're there to explain what's happening. And, um, uh, yeah, some some people liked it. Some people didn't like it. I mean, we went with traditional Galactus in terms of his look. Mm -hmm. So I thought that would hopefully be a step in the right direction compared to some of his previous adaptations. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cloud gotcha i thought that was smart the design was perfect by the way it was so good when you first tease them before that i'm like galactus wait what and then he just cuts away i'm like no i wanted to see more and then he just cut away i was like i get it because it he's a he was a part of the narrative of what they were talking about but he's not the important thing and then he just shows up hi i'm galactus i'm here i want to devour your world it's what i do for fun the other thing that we were trying to convey with him also is that like the, the heroes and everybody on earth are completely beneath his notice. Oh, so yeah. even if he can talk, he has no reason to talk to any of these people because they're, they're like insects to him and you don't generally stop and have a conversation with ants. Um, you just go about your business. That is such a good point. He's so above them. He, it won't even matter. Cause like you were saying earlier, it doesn't matter what they say. He's here to devour the world. He needs to. So it doesn't matter what the heroes say. Um, that was a really funny gag of Yellow Jacket just firing his gun and just like, all right, problem solved. No. <laughs> <laughs> but that was such a good moment. Like, is that it? No, it's not it at all. Um, 
Now, with the team ups, you guys, you, you brought in pretty much everybody back within the, the two seasons to kind of fight against this. Um, what was the thinking behind certain like team ups? Or is it just like a thing to where, okay, we have all these characters, let's add, let's, let's throw in these characters who have never interacted or hardly inter- ever interacted in the show due to different reasons? Was that just like an idea of like, just go crazy with the roster in terms of where they're going to be placed at? Yeah, we, did try to create balanced squads of people. Um, we tried to put a, a core Avenger on each one of the different squads so that there was at least a, a focal character for each one. Um, but we looked at who they were going to be fighting and what would make not only a, a, an interesting balanced team, but also create some fun character dynamics between them. I just love the thing and Wolverine on his back jumping out of the quench. I'm like, this is so good. And then the fact that he threw him a new Avengers towards Kang, but in this one, you actually see him throw him. And, um, okay. That was great. Uh, now with the amount of characters you already had in the episode for the Galactus one, was there any discussion of bringing in characters we've never introduced to, or was it like, there's too much story to tell. We couldn't properly introduce them and make it make sense for them to be there because you could have just had other X-Men you've already teased in like the wall. Nick Fury was looking at during secret invasion and go, okay, here's Cyclops. Here's, um, uh, here's beast. And they're here. I, I was there ever discussion of that or was it like, let's stick with people we've already introduced. Not really. Uh, by the time we got to that episode, we knew that the series was ending. So it was very much a wrap up episode for us. Kind of one last hurrah of, um, kind of giving everybody one one more exposure to the characters that they had seen mm. that I, that would have been great if like that wasn't if you guys knew you were getting a season three and you could have like just teased and shown okay well you know wolverine you know that really cool guy here is his team he's on and here they are um i actually wanted to ask before i jump into how far you guys got into season three because i saw christopher's tweets about what 26 episode i'm curious how accurate that would have been or may or not Um, it was a really interesting, actually two of them. It was Wolverine fighting the Raptors in the shadows (laughs) and then him off camera, his claws stabbing the face of one of the heralds. Okay. So was that in like, obviously that was intentional, but was that to where like we, you got away with it because of the censoring or was it to where they had no issue with it? Cause you weren't clearly showing the stabbing of his claws. Uh, yeah, it was definitely a way to imply violence without showing it directly on camera. Um, it, it's worth noting that when Disney XD received this series, um, it was a very different kind of show than anything that they had really had before. And the, the action and violence level was already a bit higher than anything else on the network. So their standards and practices department had to make some accommodations for the show in order for it to still feel like an action adventure Marvel show. Um, So we were a little bit lucky and a little bit privileged to be able to get away with the level of action that we did on the show, I think. But we didn't want to push it. (laughs) I I actually went back and watched the the Wolverine and Raptor fight where Spider-Man just watching and just hearing and then seeing the blood splatter outside of the Raptors, I'm like, man, they really went pretty far with that. They did. I'm like, I was quite surprised, but I thought it was a smart way to, like you said, to showcase how brutal it is. Um, and I thought when when uh, Thing threw uh, Wolverine at Kang, he was going to stab him. He just kind of hit him. I was like, oh, that would have been interesting if he would have stabbed him and they wouldn't fly. <laughs> but I guess it would have been too graphic, even if it was a little far, far away. Um, okay, so you probably can't say much, but I'm curious how far do you guys get into developing or uh, the ideas of season three? Because to me, this show should have gotten more seasons. I am so, I'm so, I lose you. I was like, I can't believe the show's over. Like, this was such a great ride, and there's so much more you guys could tell. Um, how far did you get into season three and developing it? I mean, we had ideas we had a lot of ideas um we had zero written down so like there was no formal development it was mostly stuff that chris and i had talked about that we were eventually going to do 
um, some some plot threads that we were working on in season two that we were planning to carry over into season three. Obvious ones like um, the Ragnarok story with Surtur and Thor, yeah, uh, which ended up being one of the few totally unresolved story threads in the series. Um, but there were other ones. About halfway through season two, we got kind of new marching orders for what the show needed to be. Uh, and so the last, some elements of the last 13 episodes were changed from what our original plans were. So like there were plans to have the Red Skull story be on a much slower burn that wouldn't come to a head until later on in season three or even season four. Um, and ultimately we, we were pushed away from doing that level of serialization and continuity mm. and so a lot of those storylines got wrapped up too sweet <laughs> i thought i thought you i thought the red skull reveal was pretty awesome though and the winter soldier um at, well the reveal of course winter soldier and cap first interacting after what happened to bucky and that was a smart thing to do where uh cap wished for something when he touched uh when he actually touched the cube along with um oh what's his name um I forgot the time I had what who touched Strucker. Him. Yeah, Strucker. Yeah, Ron Strucker. I that name always but then and then you cut to Bucky after he's falling, like, wait, why are we watching this again? And then he, of course, he doesn't die. Like, oh, <laughs> Winter Soldier. Um, because like uh, so with the 10-year anniversary, Chris actually tweeted out a bunch of like synopses for episodes. Was that something that completely threw you off or you kind of knew some of the stuff for the ideas. Like it kind of matched up with what you're discussing. Cause you, he went right to dark Phoenix at the end there. Yeah. Like what we could have got dark Phoenix. I don't know if that's what would have actually happened, but I mean, what was your response to all that? Because I thought I was, was outraged. I was absolutely livid and I called him and I yelled at him. No, um, <laughs> I thought, it, I thought it was a lot of fun. I thought all the stuff that he put up there was great. Obviously he was doing it just for the fun of the anniversary and to give fans um, a, a taste of some of the stuff that we might have done. Uh, mm -hmm. But we had a pretty rigorous process for crafting our stories in the first two seasons. So like if by some magical occurrence, we were to do a season three, we probably wouldn't do exactly the plot lines that he put out there um not only because we would still want to surprise people with what's coming but also because just the process of getting to the best drama is is very rigorous i think and and requires some back and forth but like i was really i was very entertained by everything that he wrote so i thought it was a lot of fun would we would we do dark phoenix maybe not an avengers show but maybe <laughs> It would be awesome. I mean, come on. I guess like the idea of like you're flipping that story on its head basically because that it focuses mainly on the X-Men. Like that's it's it's around the relation with that. But when you bring in the Avengers in the mix and these characters and how the, and the way it was kind of how you wrote it out was that it maybe it implies that they were kind of hanging out a little bit. They kind of know each other. And all of a sudden one of their members has gone crazy and now she's Dark Phoenix and now we have to put we, it, she'll destroy everything. Um I show you the very first uh, mini Bible, the very first anything that Chris wrote for the series, uh, which we had talked about, like the the mini Bible ended with like this promise that at some point we were going to do Avengers versus X-Men for sure. That was okay. the one story that we knew that we absolutely had to do and then we never got to it. <laughs> that would have been so good, though. It would have been. Um, I, I know Chris and I were both dying to do it the entire time we were working on the series and we just didn't get there. I mean, we, you can't fault us because we packed an awful lot into two seasons, but, no. and you guys did a beautiful job with two seasons. I mean, you guys did so many storylines. Like, honestly, I don't know how much more you could have added in without making the episodes hours long per episode. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, the show is getting a second life on Disney Plus, and everyone's kind of discovering the show who maybe have not seen it. Um, people are, of course, demanding for a season three and like pushing for it. Um, if there was a season three, would you jump right back in and go, let's 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 actually do more? Let's do it. Would you be? I'm assuming you would. I don't know. I mean, for a while after 
so I, I left Marvel just before the end of production on on the show, and for a while afterwards, I was kind of um, disillusioned by how things wrapped up. I wasn't completely happy with all the choices that were made, and I wasn't excited. Like, not only was it incredibly unlikely that a season three would ever happen, I wasn't that excited about the idea of doing it because we had to prematurely wrap up some of the storylines that we were telling, and um, but fans have shown so much love for the show and so much support for it and like enough time has passed now that i think chris and i talked about this not that long ago we're both kind of more open to the idea of it now than we were before um if the conditions were right and we were able to tell a season three in the way that we wanted to uh i think i think we would probably both be down for it i don't want to get anybody's hopes up because i still think it's phenomenally unlikely that it would ever happen but uh, you know i never say never i guess because there have been a lot of shows resurrected in the past few years purely due to fan support so with enough fan support anything is possible i guess the one show i can think of and i actually was helping with that online and making videos was young justice that dc show that of course ended abruptly after season uh, two seasons and I campaigned for a season three, and we finally got one. So maybe, maybe one day. Now, if you now, in your own, obviously, it wouldn't probably be your decision. But if you, if there was season three now on Disney Plus, I would assume because it's on Disney Plus, would you want to go maybe a longer format where maybe the episodes are gonna be longer, or would you try to stick around that twenty minute mark where it, if it was on uh, television, I would think you guys probably would make them a little longer. I would think. That's a great question, actually. Not something that I had given any thought to. Um, there, there was definitely always pressure to get episodes down to 22 minutes to fit on TV. But having a little bit of freedom to run over that mark, I think, I mean, I don't think that we would do 40 minute episodes or whatever, but being not having to hit like the very precise time mark would definitely be a benefit. No question. Well, that, that sounds like you guys are writing scripts that were longer than what was needed, so you had to cut stuff out. Because, I mean, that could definitely help with fleshing out story. You guys could have a little longer to kind of set up certain things, um, and then you could get to X-Men versus Avengers and make that long. Because you can make certain episodes longer, you know, depending yeah. on the story. Like, you go, okay, so we have this story, 26 minutes. Okay, now we have this, which is a part one and a part two. Let's have them both be 30-plus each and just kind of really – like, that would be awesome. <laughs> I just keep thinking about what you guys could have done and then reading his tweets. I'm like, Oh my gosh, this would have been fantastic. <laughs> um, I know. Well, I'm curious if you were to say, cause you, you said you worked on a Hulk script for a show that never got made. Was yeah. that, was that version of Hulk ever like kind of maybe worked on a little bit in terms of like, well, I didn't get to do this. So let's make the Hulk and the Avengers kind of like the Hulk there. Was this Hulk that you're working on very different? I'm curious because I, I had no idea about that. Um, there, there were a few, a small handful of ideas from that show that did make it into Avengers. Um, Hulk's personality was a bit different in the other show. Uh, he was Hulk all the time. There was no reversion to Banner. Okay. Um, and he, he was a little bit more polished than like the gruff classic Hulk that we had in uh, Avengers. Um but a few of the ideas with uh, Leader and his Gamma Boosters and some of the villains that we're, we ended up using were direct ports from the abandoned Hulk Gamma Core concept. Um, so yeah, so there's there's a few few things in the the Gamma World episodes that owe their origin to that series. I'm glad you brought that up because those are some really good stuff right there. The Leader, I mean, I love the voice. Two of my favorites. Leader. The, the look of the leader, of course, classic look and the voice. And honestly, it brought me back to the Hulk 90s animated series. I remember watching that and loving what they did with that. And the Hulk and leader reminded me a lot of that. And Abomination. Like, I really liked how you brought in Abomination. You could have easily just went like, nah, we don't. But you kept on throwing in all these characters like this. Let's go crazy. Let's add this character. Why not? Who cares? It's for fun. Um, the thinking of storytelling, I'm curious because, of course, you guys were airing on kids television was the thinking of when developing the show and the characters and the story, was it to like where, well, we're, well, obviously it's for kids, but we should, we want to tailor it to more towards 
families and maybe older fans because like I'm watching the show now. I don't know if I was if I was a little kid watching this for the first time if I would appreciate the the, the depth of story because I probably wouldn't be able to keep up with it as much. But with me now watching it now, I appreciate it so much because there's so much depth to everything you're doing. Was that like something you guys talked about where you didn't want to make it so kitty that, you know, it, it felt, you know, like, you know, these stories don't really matter because you mentioned stakes and stuff and how things can change. I mean, that's very like adult storytelling in a sense. Yeah, I've always been of the strong opinion that you don't need to talk down to kids in order to appeal to them. And actually, in some ways, the more uh, edgy and um, I don't want to say mature because that word has other connotations, but um, uh, adult, I guess, your storytelling is. Uh, in, in its nature, the more it will appeal to them. Because when you're a little kid, you always want to be doing the stuff and, and looking at the stuff that your older sibling is doing or looking at, right? And yeah. your your older sibling is looking at what adults are, are doing. And um, and I don't know, I, I just think that like, you don't, you don't have to water down your storytelling. Good, good storytelling can be targeted towards any age. I mean, that makes sense because the show, I, I think the way you guys were developing it, of course, early on, it, it definitely had a lot more than what a traditional kids show in terms of like, you know, well, it, it has a little story, but you don't have to watch week to week, or, you know, episode by episode to understand the story because they're just like one offs thing. You guys are kind of doing more depth than that, like because the characters grew, they changed, they went through some like, I mean, the whole cap arc with the scrolls, like, that whole thing where, as you were mentioning, uh, Skrullichin, <laughs> Cap, or uh, Skrull, Skrull Ultimate Cap, had that speech of, like, scrolls are here, except change, and everyone believed it was him, and then, of course, everybody doesn't trust him in the world. I mean, that was a major change in the story that I don't think I would have appreciated it or understood it if I was little watching it. But, I mean, I would have, like, okay, well, they're doing something more insane here, because I can't remember much of stuff I watched when I was little until I got to like Batman, the animated series, Spider-Man, X-Men, Hulk, that stuff in the nineties. Like that's why I started to appreciate the depth of it. And I love the fact that you're, the, the show is just like that in a sense of where I can just love the world building. Um, I'm curious, like if you were to say pitch a show that you like, besides the Hulk thing, which I think that'd have been really interesting if you had done that. Is there a team or a certain character you would love to like do a show on that maybe you haven't done before, or maybe just a character from the Avengers here that you wanted to tell like individualized stories? There were a lot, actually, even, even while I was at Marvel, I, there were a lot of shows that I wanted to do uh, and pitched at, at various times. Uh, I would say that the leading contenders, the ones that I was dying to do, um, uh, Captain America and Bucky during World War II, a series on them, I think, okay. like an action adventure, um, kind of Indiana Jones quality deal that kind of like uh, pulpy, serialized war story would be really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Daredevil, I really wanted to do something with Daredevil, but we didn't have the legal ability at the time that I was there. Um, his rights were still tied up, so uh, not even an animation form. Yeah, animation was off limits at the time. Oh, because I I think there was like a thing to where uh, Marvel can do anything Spider Man related for animation, but in live action they have to work it out with Sony. So mm -hmm. that's interesting. You couldn't. I mean, think about that. But that would have been a cool character to have in the in the show. It'd be like Daredevil just shows up because I mean you're in. Oh the yeah, I would have jumped you know? on that in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what storylines you would have covered from that. I don't know. Um, was there certain characters? Because when you introduce Spider-Man, that's a whole pantheon of stuff right there. Was there certain Spider-Man characters? Of course, you got J. Jonah Jameson in there, which was great. Was there certain characters that maybe in the Spider-Man world you, you would have wanted to incorporate more in? Or maybe even Fantastic Four? Because, I mean, you had Doctor Doom, but, you know, was there other characters within when you were expanding that you wanted to maybe incorporate that didn't? work out or we were waiting to do later um 
I think we were actually a little bit limited in who we were able to use from Spider-Man's universe when we did those episodes. Mm. Um, but I mean, the, the main boon for us was getting to use Spider-Man himself. Like every second that you're able to put Spider-Man on screen is just hugely exciting for, for both Chris and I and everybody else that worked on the show. Like, Bro. The episodes that Spidey appeared in were just special because for so long we couldn't use that character um, in animation and he became available just in time for our season two. So that was cool. Um, but in terms of his supporting cast, I mean, he's got like the best rogues gallery in all of Marveldom. So yeah, every, every one of those characters uh, eventually. It would have been fantastic because, see, he became um, – I forget the wording that Tony said to him uh, when they gave him a card. It's like, you know, thanks for helping out. You know, here's a uh, – and he asked about a discount when he became, you know, a kind of member. I would have loved if you guys could have covered a Venom-type story yeah. with the Avengers because that would have been really interesting. The symbiote, like, that would have been awesome if you guys could have done that. Um Maximum Carnage is one of my favorite Spidey stories, actually, which oh. has a bunch of crossover elements in it also. So I literally yeah. got the Maximum Carnage uh, like uh, graphic novel, the uh, all, all of it together. I'm like, I remember reading that was little and I was blown away by it. And I'm like, I have to get this. And it was luckily on sale on Amazon. I'm glad you mentioned that because that would have been great. I used <laughs> to play the video just... game, uh, Super Nintendo oh, Maximum yeah. Carnage game. So good. Yeah. But, the green jelly music on the, the title. <laughs> oh, good stuff. Good stuff. Um, so you worked on Wolverine and X-Men. I'm actually yeah, going to be yeah. starting that show next. The people voted it, demanded it. They said, you're going to be screaming again for another season once you finish. I'm like, I, I get it, but I have to watch it because people have been saying, and and is it connected to Avengers Earth's Money? So people are saying it's connected in some sort of, timeline thing is that true i mean you've worked on the show you would know yeah uh i'm i'm the number one authority on this issue uh and it's the question that i get the most often out of all questions is is the continuity thing um and the answer is kind of boring and disappointing probably for a lot of people okay. uh at the time that we started working on Earth's Mightiest Heroes, I was also the supervising producer of the second season of Wolverine and the X-Men. Oh, yes. And in my devious little mind, I had the idea that if possible, I'm going to cross over these two shows and create my own little Marvel animated universe out of them. Um, and so we had, there's like one reference very early on in Avengers of Earth's Mightiest Heroes where Nick Fury mentions the MRD, the Mutant Response Division, which mm. you'll become familiar with once you start Wolverine and the X-Men as of, okay. it's not a spoiler, it's like okay. first episode, they're front and center. Um, <laughs> uh, and that, that was my one nod from the one series to the other. Um, and as Greg Johnson, the head writer of Wolverine and the X-Men and I were working on stories for season two, we started talking about how we could potentially um, do some kind of a crossover episode between the two shows. Mm -hmm. uh, Wolverine and the X-Men season two got canceled. Before we started, Chris and I started working on Avengers season two. Mm -hmm. And by the time we were pretty deep into Avengers season two, we were both leaning in the direction of the fact that the two series probably actually aren't connected and given more time to flesh out what the X-Men are in the Avengers universe, we probably would have definitively separated them, but we never got that far. So the answer lies somewhere in between, which is that originally I intended for them to be connected and ultimately they probably weren't going to be. So if it fills fans with a great deal of joy to imagine them being in the same universe, then more power to you. I completely support that. If you don't think it's important or you don't like that idea, that is also justified. Um, so yeah, that's that's the truth of the situation. Well, I I, I did a little research on it because I remember you know people were talking about how the fact that there was no season two, and there was like a, something about where you there was a panel at Comic Con that revealed season two 
stuff and then it got canceled afterwards that really is a bum like a bummer because you guys literally showcase certain stuff for what was upcoming for the next season and yeah, then- that was it was a tragedy we were we were very far into mm-hmm. development and pre-production for season two of wolverine and the x-men and um the production company that was producing the show. So Avengers is my Mightiest heroes was produced internally by Marvel. Wolverine and the X-Men was started in the period when um, we were still having outside production companies do all of, all of the production work and financing for the shows. Mm-hmm. Um, and the financing fell through for the producer. And that was the end of the show. <laughs> <sighs> that sucks. That really does. Cause like, because it sounds like you guys did a lot of work already for season yeah. two. I you think had designs for characters that weren't even season one that you were going to do in season two. We had, I want to say, eight finished scripts already mm. for the season. And those are out there somewhere. They got leaked a while back. So oh. after you finish watching season one, you can probably tr- track those down and, and read them. And we had tons of designs already done. And mm. um, uh, it was exciting. We were, it was one of the most challenging um, pieces of storytelling that I have worked on because what we were doing was so complicated, mm-hmm. but it was super cool. I'm excited to get into it because for me, one of the, one of my favorite anime shows of all time was X-Men the animated series and how like they just threw in everything basically in that show. And it was like so crazy to see it. And then you hear all the behind the scenes stuff of that. So I'm really excited to watch this show because people have talked about it so much saying it's um, one of the best adaptations of the characters and that there was a lot of crazy stuff that you guys did. And then of course, no season two, which it's crazy because I think if you're going to, if you're like, if you're that much into season two, try to find a way to make it work. I mean, I would say, I mean, at least, cause I mean, that's eight scripts you guys pretty much had done and they're like, ah, we're pulling the plug that, that, that is ridiculous. Yeah, it was, that's the business for you, I guess. That's the business. It is, uh, it is, and if if people know like how many shows that I pitched and did partial development on that n- never made saw the light of day, they would probably be aghast. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thank you so much for coming on and talk with me. Uh, what are you working on right now that people can look forward to? Um, so the next thing of mine that people will probably see, uh, I wrote a mini series based on Capcom's Monster Hunter games oh. called Monster Hunter Legends of the Guild. Mm. Um, and that does not have a release date yet, but I think something may be announced in the not too distant future. I'm not, I haven't heard much. Again, the life of a writer is that you finish your work on something and never hear about it again. So, um, Hopefully that they let you know soon or something. At, at such a time as an announcement is made, I definitely will post it to my Twitter and let everybody know what's going on. And is that your Twitter at Josh Fine or underscore that, Fine? That is right so, there. Yeah, over there. <laughs> there. Well, thank you so much for coming on and chat with me. And uh, if there is a season three of Avengers vs. My Heroes, we have to chat again. But that's absolutely. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would like to chat with you again just in general because. This was really fascinating, especially, okay, once Wolverine the X-Men's done, I will reach out to you, and I want to talk to you about the Wolverine I the would love to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me.